We're, um, I, I work for OpenEye, uh, and we're heavy users of Sci4. Um, uh, this work is um, a, a, the OpenEye Physics Group, and so I, I, you see the names uh, and myself. Um, okay, so I thought, uh, be, you know, explaining crystal structure prediction, I just thought I would use an example. Uh, not that we've worked on this one, but it's a good paper and a good example. So this is a, a recent drug from Eli Lilly that's an anti-cancer agent. And in the formulation, so CSP is uh, part of, uh, of interest to drug companies for the formulation aspects. And um, this is probably a, an unusually uh, bad example, but um, uh, Galanisertib, they've, they've identified 10 polymorphs actually during the course of working on formulation. And this has been a very long and painful uh, experience for them. Uh, so here I just wanted to show you, you had this formed one on the left and monohydrate is the preferred formulation. And um, basically they have a total of form of 10 forms here. And you also see that over the course of this time, they've uh, identified all these different experimental, let's say, thermodynamic conditions under which you can convert these in between each other. And they, they really want, in order to control things, they want to know this as much as possible. Okay, so how could computation help? And I, I'll point out this was not our work. OpenEye was not involved. But uh, this is work for Susan Rutzel, Aidens in collaboration with Sally Price, who's been a pioneer in CSP, crystal structure prediction. So I would just point out that this thermodynamic stuff, thats they would really like that in addition to properties of these crystals predictions. But it's too hard still. I mean, I think thermodynamics is um, simply too hard for um, at this point. Uh, I mean, there's too much work involved and a lot of stuff. So anyway, but on the other hand, we're starting to be able to predict these um, different crystal forms. And so that's what crystal structure prediction is about. They would like to be able to see, can we find all these forms? And uh, also, are there any others out there they need to worry about? Okay. Hmm, let's see, I sort of stuck. Um, okay. Uh, so we do have an, uh, uh, a collaboration with GSK, however, where they're giving us some uh, blind prediction challenges. So given the, the smile string, which is a simplified re representation of the connectivity of the molecule and the um, uh, nature of the bonds, et cetera. Can we predict the crystal structure and potential polymorphs? Okay, so here's uh, where we're at at that. I'll just give you the summary, but uh, so far there've been six challenges. And on five of them, we did amazingly well. Uh, this is better than we expected, I would say. And uh, blind prediction's a bit scary. We had no idea what the answer is. We still don't know the exact answer, they haven't given us that. They just tell us how we're doing. Um, and as far as a match goes, that's a, a type of RMS cluster, uh, root mean square of the, of the crystal cluster, let's say. However, I just say we, we weren't perfect. We failed so far on one of them that had 11 rotatable torsions. And this is just a matter of we just overwhelmed by the amount of uh, samples generated that we needed to evaluate. So I'll say a bit more about this process now. Um, so this is what you count on is this kind of a fold, it's like protein folding. You have uh, many, many local minima at the top of this uh, high energy, let's say. Uh, and, and then you, you hope that you have not so very many local minima at the bottom, okay? Uh, and so far that seems to be true, but it's, it's really just a hope. And, um, so, so the whole idea is to rapidly get rid of the very, very many local minima and find the ones that look promising for more detailed methods. So you use cheap methods at the top and expensive methods at the bottom. In more detail, you start with a 2D structure, you start generating uh, conformers, and usually it's about 500 conformers, maybe 1,000 conformers, a couple thousand, but I gave you the 11 rotatable bonds, so it's possible to have this stuff explodes exponentially with the size of things. And also if there's co-crystals, solvates, et cetera, the confirmation problem explodes on you. And for each confirmation and, and a, a series of space groups that you're gonna choose to search through, you generate a lot of 
maybe a thousand per conformer per space group, uh, random packings, which you then have to evaluate. So this is a huge number of um, packings that need to be evaluated, and you certainly are not going to do quantum chemistry on all of them. So you need a lot of cheap methods that you hope can get you down to something on the order of 100 to 500 that we're going to do minimization and re-ranking of the top uh, packings. Okay, so so now on to how does Psi4 come into this? So the QM optimization and evaluation, this is once you get to the 500, let's say, structures that you think you're going to take a more serious look at. Most groups in this field use plane wave codes, VASP in particular, uh, or else quantum espresso. On the other hand, we use a cluster expansion approach, and it's like um, the uh, the Barron group uh, at uh, UC uh, Riverside, I think it is, uh, or um, the Dave Sherrill's group here at Georgia Tech. Uh, I'll say that what's different about ours, I think different in any case, is that we, our whole cluster building and optimization gradients, et cetera, et cetera, it's all based on space groups. So where other people might be using um, some kind of geometric comparisons, I'm doing a group theory, basically. <laughs> to get things uh, back to asymmetric units. Uh, all the calculations um, uh, the, of cluster calculations run on this Orion, which is OpenEye's um, interface to AWS at this point. I guess it can work with other cloud-based providers, but mainly AWS. Uh, for optimization and phonons, we use the two-body, uh, expansion up to two-body at this point, um, and mainly use HF3C for quantum. Uh, we do have the three-body implemented and played around with that a little bit. It's more expensive, obviously. Uh, we could use more sophisticated theory, but I want to point out HF3C is pretty amazing so far, how well it does. It, um, very good bit of uh, parameterization and level of theory. Uh, on the other hand, we've tried uh, cheaper methods, semi-empirical force fields, tight binding, and these have all given me problems. Uh, I've run them on a bunch of uh, examples, and uh, it's just none of them are robust. Uh, by semi-empirical, I mean PM6. Tight binding, I've done T something called DFDP+, plus, and I've also used XTB from Grima. And in all cases, there's just molecules where things fall apart, and HF3C uh, does well. So uh, I should say there's problems for salts, uh, because obviously you can't have a mixture on a cluster of positive and negative molecules that you're randomly interacting with. But if you combine them into dimers, that's our solution for now. But this is going to be our seventh blind challenge uh, from GSK that we're just coming up against is what to do about salts. We're trying to avoid going to plane wave because it's very much slower. Um, but, and I'm looking forward to what Andy Simonette has to say tomorrow about embedding. Uh, for evaluations, we're using B3LIP with the D3MBJ um, dispersion correction and at more or less OxyCP VDZ level or maybe DEF2 um, singular TZ. I, I don't know yet. But anyway, this is what we're using with is OxyCP VDZ with some HF3C for longer range dimers and three body if we feel it's necessary. And that's it. That's the overview.